Well, I suppose, Heather, you are doing this episode, so do you wish to also give us the introductions this week? No, because I'm not sure what what should we say at the intro now. Like, what are we saying? Well, that's a great start. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives. <laughs> episode 45, now... We did a little bit more research and we're finally going to be bringing Basho to you today. It's very much like how we've done Hokusai and what else? The History of Rice. Very much like a brief introduction. There is a lot about him, so we obviously will come back at a later date, which we're looking forward to. Uh, but yeah, we're a small little podcast, a little duo who every week come together, talk about the, the histories, the myths, the legends that make up Japanese history. Uh, I'm your host, Thomas. I'm your co-host, Heather. And how are we doing this week, Heather? Well, in today's weather report, it's it's Suyu season, which uh, is the rainy season. Usually June is considered the rainy season of Japan, where we just have lots of rain and rain and rain. But it seems to have held off for us till at least kind of like the end of June. So it was supposed to be rain, rain, rain all day, but somehow the sun came out. Um, I'm a little confused, not complaining, um, but I have bought some rainy day preparation things. Like I've got my little moisture containers that help keep, um, cause when it, you know, it rains, the insulation here is not fantastic and the window ceilings aren't fantastic either so we have to do like preparation and like specific kind of cleaning to make sure we don't get lots of mold everywhere and our clothes don't get moldy smelling and it's a really interesting time of year without much further ado i'm gonna just hand it over to you today for you to enlighten me with your introduction to matsuo basho thank you thomas so today we are going to do beginning basho so like you mentioned at the beginning, to, to look into Basho's life, I mean, we've, we've touched on him so many points um, during this podcast, and we've encountered him through other poets, and even in some of the stories and topics you've told, we seem to encounter him a lot. So I know both you and I felt like we wanted to do a more thorough research into his life, because we, we've done a little bit here and there, because we've had quite a few of his poems, but kind of like Hokusai, I wanted to talk a little bit about his life for this episode and not just that i want to focus more on his early life because his later life his we have his journeys we have a lot of information about him but i feel like we want to focus on those journeys like alone we don't want to just have a, a short mention we want to actually have a a longer time to mention them and go through them plus there is a lot of literary criticism that I think both you and I, we don't feel like we're quite at the stage yet to really do justice to to that sort of study. We can try, but I feel like it's something that to do justice to Basho, we should come back to it at a later point. So we're going to just kind of focus on more of his early life and we'll go from there because there's quite a few interesting things about his early life that that does influence later and also the really interesting thing is that his early life is not quite known i know some of the sources i i used for today sometimes gave slightly conflicting information or similar information but a little bit different uh, i think you may have encountered the same right i have known then come across certain inconsistencies and well when i briefly looked through your notes as well like you've covered a lot of the stuff that i already knew because i know for this episode it was more of a we wanted to do the research together mm. it was going to be led by you but do the research together in case there's things we missed to expand it but mostly we covered the same thing and we came across the same inconsistencies i find it interesting that there does seem to be these inconsistencies considering that it's not that ancient history really mm. Mm. and he was obviously so famous and so well known in japan it seems odd that we don't have the concrete story for him mm. totally agree with that and that was really interesting i think something that you'll notice with this episode this is a different style than we have done in the past where we have both tried to do a lot of research 
And we we did the research on our own separately and we compared notes after. So this is a little bit different format than we have done um, with both of us trying to have like a, a more similar knowledge level studying sometimes the same sources, but sometimes a little bit different to try to compare. So there's going to hopefully be some, we're, we're going to have some discussion and probably one of us might interrupt the other at some point because I think for Basho, I love the fact that we're, we're going to talk about this later, but I'm going to bring it in. One of the things that he feels like he was his strength was not really his poetry, but in the organizing of the poetry and working with people and talking with people and having those conversations. So almost in a very amateur tribute to him, I hopefully would like to have more of that kind of give and take that ebb and, ebb and flow, <laughs> that ebb and flow that feels more like poetic in a way, even though both you and I are not poets. So Basho was born in Iga province in Ueno City, which is during the Edo period in 1644. However, he died in 1694. So 50 years, only 50 years old when he died. And these are 50 short years that profoundly influenced Japanese poetry and culture. He's got a long list of published works, and based on the, I did pull this from Wikipedia to get his full list, it numbered well into the 20s. So I am not going to sit here and read out the entire list because it might be a little bit boring, but you can go and look. We'll include our source, sources in the end of the podcast. Uh, out of the out of the list, because you looked at this list and I didn't, is most of his publications, is there more poetry publications or are there more travel publications on the whole because obviously he did a lot of traveling but he's also well known for being a poet so i'm just wondering if he published more about his journeys or if he published more about his poetry in his life so he's got a lot of poetry books and then there's also his his journeys which include poetry as well so okay based on the fact i'm just looking at the list and i am not i have not physically looked at these works to my knowledge and understanding at this point in time, it is a lot of poetry works, poetry works. But when, oh, what was it last year? We went to the library to look up a poem by an author and the name escapes me at the moment. His poetry was put into like, is, is part of his journal. So they had taken out the lines um, for this particular poem. But when you go and look at it, it's actually part of the entire journal. So. What we might think of possibly, and I've got to get my hands on these books in Japanese, which I think now might be okay to go to the library, perhaps. It might look more like we might think of more of a journal style. So I'm interested in that. Thank you for that question. I'll see if I can come back to you on that. But I feel like it's it's mostly the poetry and some journal entries included as well. Okay. Thank you. You are so welcome. And also, it did mention for Iga Province, um, Iga province is at, now known as Mie Prefecture. So Iga province was the old name for Mie Prefecture. Now Basho, we know him as Matsuo Basho, but he was born Matsuo Munefusa. Now he was born into either a, a samurai family of minor status or perhaps a family who could, could, could claim descent from samurai depending on your source. Uh, I don't know, what what did your sources say for his his family's origin? My sources were coming back as he was born into a samurai family. Okay. And that his dad was like a retainer of sorts to mm -hmm. a local powerful official. Hmm. I think I saw the, the source for the, the powerful of, official as well, but his family was not wealthy. That is the one thing I did find in okay. in my research, that his family was not wealthy. And it seems that he was perhaps the middle child with three older siblings and three younger ones. Because his family was not wealthy, Basho became a servant, or you put as a page, depending on your source, around the age of nine. Although somewhere else, I did see that they said he was probably, might, I might have been a little older, but he was placed into the Toro family. He ended up studying alongside the family's son named Yoshitada. And Yoshitada 
was not healthy. He was more like not of strong constitution and had some health issues. And so he, his studies seemed to be more focused on literature and arts versus the more strenuous activities like martial arts or, you know, swordsmanship or anything like that. So he studied more literature. So Yoshitara and Basho studied, studied Hoku. And this is the previous name for haikai or haiku. So it was, it was known back in Edo as Hoku. They even had pen names. Sengen for Yoshitara and Sobo for Basho. And the Sobo came from, I believe it was from, well, Munefusa, it, Matsuo Munefusa, from his kanji, he could do, I think, a different reading. So that's kind of where his first pen name came from. So he was known as Sobo and not Basho. Unfortunately for Yoshitara and for Basho, but most especially Yoshitara, he died in 1666 and he was only 25 years old. So really young. When Yoshitada was with Yosh, when Yoshitada, when Basho was with the Toda family at the time, was he the same age as Yoshitada, or was he a little older or younger? So in 1666, Yoshitada was 25. They were very similar in age. Uh, Yoshitada was just a little bit older than Basho because in 1666, Basho would have been around 22. Now it seems that. Basho's, and I'm, I'm using Basho because we know him as Basho, even though his name was different. We could say Sobo. We could say Sobo. So Sobo's service ended. Now, I'm going to ask you, Thomas, um, well, in my sources, I saw some different information. One is that he asked to be released because Yoshitara had died. And another one said he had just ran away because he was denied being released from his service. So... That is a couple of different things I saw, but he definitely left the service, the service of the Toto family. Yeah, the one I came across said that he um, he did ask to be released after Yoshitada had died. So what happened after the service ended then? Did he go on to serve someone else or? Well, we've got a little bit of mm, not fluidity, but not quite knowing what's the, what's another word for not quite knowing it's a little bit of a mystery perhaps he might have gone okay. to kyoto he might have gone to a temple we aren't quite sure we do know he published some things during this time but where exactly mm, one of my sources said kyoto and one other one said not quite sure so i mean as he was probably in that mie prefecture i mean kyoto was pretty close so he he might have gone and these publications at the time they're before he went on his travel so i suppose they were just poetry compilations at the time he was published in anthologies um one of the the, the notes i'm seeing here is the first one i've noticed is 1667 so a year after yoshitara died he was published in a anthology and then he also published his own compilation that was in 1672 Okay. Now, we don't know exactly where he was during this time, but we do know that after a while, he traveled to Edo. And Edo, as we know it now, is Tokyo. This is based on my knowledge by what's been shared with me by the professor. And Thomas, I don't know if, if you know this or not, um, or if it's something you've heard or not, but this is something I was told, is that Kyoto, like even now, because it, it is an old city and you know it was a capital, it's considered to be a more like formal and conservative type city, very traditional, very mm, I wouldn't say rigid seems like a hard harsh word to say, but more more certain things done in a certain way and very proper and formal and very traditional. I have heard that. I mean, you can kind of still see it now. Mm. Even when you get, go to Kyoto, people, some people still see it as the capital. They've tried to keep it more traditional. It Obviously, it has modernized, but they tried to keep it, how to say, culturally historical. Would that be a good term for it? Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, we, we 
it's it's sort of like we don't want to give it a <laughs> we're not trying to sound negative we're trying to emphasize that kyoto because it's an older city like that cultural historical significance to a specific way of thinking that is just part of the the history of the city now edo was a new city and it was very exciting and there was a lot of things going on. So it was a kind of a, a lively, more vibrant atmosphere versus the more traditional feeling of Kyoto. So for Basho, this must have been like a, a place that had a lot of possibilities and new things and new ideas could happen. And so it's here that Basho met the poet Soin and his pen name changed again. It became Tose. Edo, exciting city. It was during this time that Basho began to change his idea of poetry. I'm going to quote from one of the sources I use, which is the, the Penguin book of Basho's travels. And Basho said his idea of poetry came from the special value in poetry of the humble and unpretentious imagery of everyday life. So rather than having kind of like a high-minded ideal the simple, the humble, just everyday life, to make poetry from that simplicity, from that just, I have that word, unpretentious, <laughs> unpretentious imagery uh, of, just, of just life, of simple life. So is that potentially why he wrote an entire poem about a banana plant? Oh, <laughs> you're, oh my gosh. I'm going to talk about the banana plant. That is... A really, oh, okay. a, I'm sorry to jump forward. Perfect. No, I love it so much because the banana plant is important. And I bet you remember this poem from episode 22. Would you like to read it? Okay. Basho uete. Mazu nikumu ogi no futaba kana. So at some point, Basho was dissatisfied with the trappings of the city. And he decided to have a more simple life and move to Fukugawa. It's here that we encounter the fateful banana tree that had the miscanthus bud. Remember miscanthus? This banana plant was given to Basho by his disciples. The first word you read in that poem, what, what was that first word again? What was the first word? Basho. Yeah, that's... I was going to ask what that meant in Japanese, um, but I feel like you're about to tell me. Banana plant. So banana plant is Basho. Yep. And that's where he got his final name. And the one we know him by is Basho. He took that from the banana plant that his disciples gave him. So I love that we touched on that poem, but we did not. I don't I don't think we touched on, um, you know, the actual Basho. I mean, maybe we might have mentioned it, but it has been so long ago. Episode 22 feels like a lifetime ago. That we. We even talked about it because we, I know we focused on the miscanthus. We were very interested in the miscanthus. So he was given his banana plant by his disciples and he took his name from it. So what happened next during his time in Edo? Well, he, and, and actually Fukugawa is near the Sumida River. I looked it up really quickly while we were talking and it's the Sumida River. So it is, um, you can actually... In part of Tokyo, you will run into the Sumida River. Unfortunately, um, Basho's house burned down. So his house burned down. He then stayed with a friend in Yamanashi Prefecture. And it's here he wrote another collection of poems. And this was called the Minashi Guri, or the Empty Chestnut. Interesting name. Go on. And somewhere in, I'm not sure my source now, I'm just remembering I read this somewhere, but it, someone said that, I forget which source material it was, it might have been the Penguin book, that the that emptiness feeling was, you know, due to the fact that he kind of felt more, you know, losing his home. And there was, I don't know if you encounter this in your your studies, but the reason why he he left to move out of out into the countryside was because there was he wanted to have that kind of more simplicity and getting back to like his poetry focused more on the 
unpretentiousness of just everyday simple life. I do know that he did study, I think it was Zen Buddhism. He had a, a lot of things. He wrote, written a lot. He had a lot of like ancient disciples or learners that gathered around him and, you know, helped him and gave him things. And not just that, they also built him another house in 1683. A lot of things happened to Basho. One of them was his mother died in 1683. And so actually earlier in 1683, the house was built later in 1683. But again, not quite content to honestly, probably not very content in wanting to wander and explore and to enlarge himself and to improve himself like to he he went through you know quite a few things house burning down his mother died dissatisfaction it seems like this possible dissatisfaction with life as well and i think around that time let's see he was 39 yeah 39 around you know kind of i guess that um sort of he's close to 40. he decided in 1684 that he wanted to travel instead and so when he traveled he relied entirely on temples, on the hospitality of temples he, he came across in his journey, as well as the hospitality of his fellow poets. Thomas, I know you've been to a handful of temples here and there, you know, maybe. <laughs> I have many temple stamps, yes. So have you seen at temples, It there will be kind of like a, an open platform with a little kind of shelter? Oh, yes, yes. That is where Basho would have stayed. Okay, so it was lodgings of a sort for travelers at the time or maybe pilgrims or visiting monks and nuns okay so i think in some temples you can there's actual places you can stay but the that kind of platform pavilion area if you see them those were specifically made for travelers travelers could stay and sleep on this this little kind of shelter sheltered area for a night so you can go to even, I think even now, if you need a shelter, you could go and sleep on the platform at the temple. You know, don't quote me on that. But historically, those spaces, when you walk by and see them, that is where people would have stayed on their journeys. Oh, that's interesting. I, I learned that recently from the professor. So it's here that we are going to leave Bashol because we want to cover- So soon. Yes, we want to cover his journeys another time, but it seems based on my research and my knowledge at this point, his travels were based on a sense of trying to find himself to hone his craft, to get closer to his poetry. And I had mentioned before that we, we might think of Basho as a haiku master, and that's not how he's known, I believe, in most of the world, but he himself thought his true talent was in linking Renga verses. And there's a quote from Basho that I want to leave us with today. Besides, I do have a poem, one more poem at the end, but this quote I want to leave Basho before we send him on his journey. And this is from the Penguin edition from the translated version of Journey to the North. Go to the pine if you want to learn about the pine. Go to the bamboo if you want to learn about the bamboo. And in doing so, you must leave your subjective preoccupation with yourself. Otherwise, you impose yourself on the object and do not learn. However well phrased your poetry may be, if your feeling is not natural, if the object and yourself are separate, then your poetry is not true poetry, but merely your subjective counterfeit. I can relate to that in that mm -hmm. I write a lot of books and stories so for me where you said however well phrased your poetry may be for me it's like however well phrased your writing may be I, I get it like if you're trying to force something if you're not writing it how you would naturally do something then it's not going to sound like yourself some some external force might read it and think oh that is good but you as a person know that it is not you you're kind of giving a false image of yourself and I suppose mm -hmm. the for Japan, the idea of poetry was you ha you are like bearing your soul in a way. So there is no point in not showing your true self in poetry because otherwise your poetry is in essence a lie. I like that. I like that. I think I, I want to have a discussion about this 
quote, but I love how you how that interpretation for your writing. And it's it's a quote that I keep coming back to. And I feel like I want to come back to this poem and this poem. I want to come back to this quote again when we come back to Beshel, because it's one of those things I feel like you have to have a time to think on. Like you have to have you have to have that time to think. You have to kind of kind of sit with the quote and come back to it. It's a, a definitely reflective. So I said reflective. So and this quote for me feels really reflective. I want to take time to think about it and also to revisit with you because now I wanted you to think about it because we both talk often about like writing and creative type endeavors and trying to improve ourselves when we write and trying to get that sometimes I guess inspiration and assistance in a way. I love I love that you went ahead and were, were thinking about it because I, I definitely want to come back and it it this quote it really hit me and I'm still not finished processing it even days and days after I wrote these notes up. I think you have a couple of things that you wanted to mention. So there was one interesting thing I came across. It wasn't even during my Basho research. It actually <laughs> came about from, let me just check which episode it was. It was all the way back. I say all the way. It was only episode 41 when you did Mukai Kyorai, who was a disciple of Basho. So I was adding him... After I did the show notes for that episode, I read a few of my other books to see if I could find any more information to add him onto our database. And I came across one interesting thing which linked to Basho. And this was that, obviously, you've said Basho wrote many things during his lifetime, especially diaries and travel journeys. And... One of the diaries which he did write called the Saga Niki, he actually wrote during one of his many stays with Mukai. Uh, they apparently grew very close during their lives. And often when Basho would visit Kyoto, he would actually stay in Mukai's country cottage, which was known as Rakushisha. And while he was there, he wrote one of his diaries. So that was a little bit of extra that I found out before we even planned this Basho episode. Oh, that's so, Thomas, anything else you would like to add? Not for now. That was just the one extra tidbit that I found for us. I'm, if there is anything else, I'm not recalling it right now, but I suppose at this point we can leave it until we come back to him and we start his, well, a deep dive into one or two of his journeys around Japan. Yeah, and, and with that being said, what we've talked about today is based on the current level of research that we have done. There is a little bit of, I've, I've encountered some conflicting information, and I feel that as we study Basho more, we might come back to this episode and go, oh, we weren't quite right on that. So I definitely want to emphasize that this is beginning Basho. This is the first of hopefully a few episodes that we will have on him. So we've done our best to try to give you the information that we have based on our current level of research. But, you know, things can be subject to change. And as we encounter more Bashol, we can change a little bit of our, our ideas. And I am quite happy with that. It makes me really excited to study more. I want to leave today with probably Bashol's most famous haiku. And Thomas, if you would please do me the honors of reading it in Japanese. Furi ike ya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. So the English translation for this poem, um, which is dated to 1686, is an ancient pond, a frog jumps in, the splash of water. And you say this is his most famous? Consider, considered one of his most famous or most well-known. If you see Basho, you will probably encounter this frog. Dare I ask why this one has such prominence? Let's leave that for another day with Basho. How cryptic are you? <laughs> well, Heather, I want to say thank you for the beginning of Basho. I do look 
forward to coming back to him. Uh, some, I'm, I think some listeners might wondering why we haven't done this as like an AB type episode as we have done before. And I think the easiest way to explain that is I feel that Basho is going to be more than a two episode thing, which is why we wanted to do it a bit like Shinto, like every now and then we'll come back to him and do the next big chunk of his life. Um, Basho has done a lot, so it will probably be three, four, even five episodes by the end, Ooh. I presume. But yes, thank you, Heather, for all of your research. It was actually nice. It was actually, it was actually nice. nice. I, I thought it was going to be like, I thought it'd be horrible. No, it was, it was very interesting. Nice to listen to. You had some things that I hadn't found on my research, which was interesting. But yeah, obviously no literary corner today. The whole thing was the literary corner. Now, before we sign off and do our outros, I think it's safe to say, well, I think we should tell people what our plans are for the coming weeks. And next week, we want to do another ghost story. Yay. Now, this is going on from our tra translation tradition of last year where Heather was telling us how summer in Japan you tell a ghost story because it makes you shiver and cools you down so next week I want to tell you the story of the peony lantern and for the literary corner well I guess that's going to be a surprise I was doing research and then I found something else and so now I've got like two or three things that might happen next week so I'll let you know soon <laughs> Well, anyway, guys, thank you again for tuning in this week. Hello to our few new listeners as well going on from last week. You can follow us on social media, obviously, over on Facebook and Twitter over at Japan Archives. If you wish to follow us on Instagram, you can follow my personal one over at Nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S. I upload every now and then like pictures mm -hmm. that pictures that I take as I'm exploring the temples and the streets of Japan. And if you are interested in the show notes, then please make sure to head over to head over to japanarchivespodcast.com. You can find the show notes there, like I said, but also see all the pages we've added to our growing database on Japanese history. But I think that's everything from me it's, it's on this outro segment. I don't know, Heather, do you have anything to add before we properly sign off for today? Little slices of life at heatheroveryonder.com. Sometimes very slow updating slices of life. So, But slices of life nonetheless. Yes. That's all okay. for me too. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for tuning in this week. And we'll catch you next time. またね。